Hey everyone, welcome back to the Detections Challenging Paradigms podcast. This week on episode four, we talked to Joe Vest, a red teamer at AWS, about how red team or threat emulation is an integral component of detection and response. Through his career, Joe has accumulated a wide range of experience in red team operations through his work with a DOD red team, running his own business, Menace, and as a director at Spectre Ops. In addition, he has actively worked to share this experience with the industry through a SANS course he authored on the topic and his book titled Red Team Development and Operations, co-authored by James Tuberville. We hope you enjoy this episode. Luke, go ahead and play that intro. Starting like five seconds, so let's just go five, four. Hey, Joe, thanks for uh, joining us today, man. How you doing? Doing awesome. How you guys? Doing well. How's uh, that Florida weather treating you? It uh, it's guilty because I know half the world or half the country got frozen, and it dipped down into like the the high thirties, but it's back up into like the sixties and seventies. So it's been nice and sunny. So little guilty to have some some nice weather right now yeah well well texas was in the ice age vegas was thriving so life was good for jared and i as well yeah (laughs) thanks for blatantly pointing out that my life sucked for a week no water no internet fires everywhere luke literally was working with me today and he he's like hold on i gotta go uh check the water and see if it's boiling so that i could drink it later yeah we're still in a boil water <laughs> notice so i have yeah, i have like a big pretty, pot on the stove of drinking water <laughs> it's very very intense like it's pretty nuts to to see that that happened to texas man are you still doing a lot of longboarding out there me yeah I, um well, uh, the winter time slowed down some, but uh, I've actually started biking, and uh, I've actually paddleboard probably more than anything else. So probably out on the water as soon as soon, probably the next like three or four weeks, um, the weather will be stable enough. I'll be back out in the water. It's it's beautiful lake, uh, dune lakes that spill out into the Gulf. It's awesome out here for that. That sounds great, you actually. You sent me a awesome. picture. You sent me a picture of a bike. Did you did you buy that already, or are you planning on buying that? Or that's what? the bike. I got it on order. Yeah, so I have okay. a, a gravel bike that that I have nice. on order. Um, with the bike shortages going on, it's been hard to do. So I went ahead and ordered it even back in December, knowing I won't get it till March. So, but yeah, oh, yeah. with with COVID, like the cycling industry got hit extremely hard yeah. with trying to um, try like with selling out, especially like entry level type bikes. So anything with like below $2,000, basically yep. it's like that is no longer available. Like, uh, I do, I have a cycling coach and he, uh, his shifter broke on his, on his bike and he's been out of road cycling for like four weeks trying to find a shifter and he has yeah. like direct wholesale connections. And so, you know, if you're a normal person trying to buy components or bikes or whatever, it's impossible pretty much. Yeah. yeah I went, Last November, December time frame, walked into a bike shop that was happened to be open. They had bikes everywhere and they said, hey, welcome. None of these are for sale. This is stuff we're working on, fixing. They're doing a lot of repairs and stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's like, well, we, you, I can answer questions, but you can't buy anything. <laughs> what what brand is the new bike? Uh, it's Priority. Nice. Yeah, so it's a belt-driven bike. So it's, uh, it, it's a gravel bike. Um, I used to mountain bike years and years ago, do a lot of single track. So I wanted to, just where I live now, um, Florida is, if you didn't know, it's a little flat. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's different. <laughs> it's different. So I, uh, and, and, and where I live is there's 20 plus miles of like, uh, good, um, biking down highway 30A, uh, that you can go everywhere. So it's very much a, an outdoor, um, area. So I just wanted to get something that's kind of crosses between the two. Cause there's some, some trails around here too. So. Give it a shot. Okay. See how that goes. You still yeah, rock grab the one wheel at all? Man, I sold my one wheel for this bike. It's I in have your to Twitter bio. You can't sell it. I, well, <laughs> I mean, then, I, then, I, then I keep things outdated. Um, but yeah, I actually sold that thing because, I mean, I have like five paddle boards now. Um, if you see like, go down to my garage with all the, like, all those toys and stuff. Uh, 
you know, we have a ton of boards that I'll go surfing on or go paddling on. So, you know, things, things shift and change as you're down here, even though one willing was awesome down here. It's just, I had to limit my toys, you know? Cool. But. Yeah. So, uh, today we tweeted out the announcement of, of this episode. And one of the things that we kind of talked about, and I think one of the things that you have a great insight into because, uh, of your, your background at menace and then some of your experience at specter ops, and then you've taken it onto your, your new job, um, is how does, how does red teaming like collaborate or, you know, work with the blue team or the detection response team. And I think, I think you have, uh, there's, a, there's generally like a misconception, whether explicitly or implicitly that, uh, they're kind of opposing forces. But, uh, like one of my thoughts is that the, the red team is actually part of the blue team. So it's a, a component or a function of detection and response. Um, curious what your kind of thoughts are on that and how you would define what the, the red team's responsibility is. That is a, I actually think that's a 100% right. And I would even argue that I thought differently in the beginning. If you kind of take a step back in the community of, of especially people learning, want to go do hacking things and such, there's the idea of offensive security and defensive security. But when you, when you take a look at, uh, and it sounds bad, but back to business, why you're doing this, you know, how you're doing this, what you're looking for, uh, you're not getting paid to hack or break into anything. You're really ultimately trying to mitigate and fix and, and make things better. So I, I totally agree that the red team, the offensive security part is really a subset of defense. That's really what they're there for. And when you start to shift uh, mindsets and shift uh, the offensive security team's um, ideas that they're focusing on defense, it actually can change and make their, um, their engagements much, much better. Because now they're not just saying, let me show you all the things I did. I hacked this. I jumped on this box. I moved over here. I copied all the stuff. I did it. You know, look at me. I, I hacked all the things. And then it's like, well, so what? I mean, what do we do about that? And then those red teams who don't think that they're part of defense often don't have any clue as to um, how defenders are actually going to deal with the situation. It's like, okay, you, you gave me 20 ways that you just broke into this network how you can laterally move, steal creds, privx, all of those those neat, nice hacking things. So what? What are we going to do about that? How am I going to 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 work on this? And, and that even that leads the uh, the offensive security engineers to understand that they need to know how defenders think. Um, another, because a big problem I see in our industry right now is uh, that dividing line, where uh, so you do a red team engagement, pen test. I don't care what it is. You do some sort of security in engagement. Said, here's all the bad things. You you provide a whole list of these findings, observations, however you want to present that. And everyone says, okay, what are the mitigations? I'd argue that the offensive security teams who provide mitigations only provide a one-sided story. So they provide it from the offensive view, unless they actually understand those defensive context. And unless you are intimately familiar with the defensive of like an organization or the capabilities and limitations, your mitigations and your recommendations may be worthless. And I've seen tons of mitigations just go on the shelf and have no no way of action uh, taking action on them. So, but yeah, yeah I, think there's, a, I think there's an interesting like uh, interesting dilemma where offense is something that can be so it's asymmetrical to some degree, right? So. Um, it kind of pains me to use the term asymmetrical, but um, the idea that offense can be executed successfully by one person or a small small team as to where kind of a detection response team or like a, a defensive security team, it's a, it's a team sport to where you have multiple people, uh, multiple teams that are collaborating together. And kind of like what you're saying is uh, if you don't understand how that team, so it's not as simple as saying, and this this is where we get into the issue of like, offensive security tools, it's really easy to put something out on GitHub and then other people are able to leverage that. It's really difficult for me to put out, even if I were to have a fully uh, flushed out detection and I put it out on the on the internet, on GitHub for somebody to take, being able to integrate that into their, into their pipeline, their detection process would be relatively difficult because it's like, okay, well, do you have uh, the telemetry that you need to, to actually perform this detection? Are you centralizing that telemetry? Um, do you have do you have an ability to query that kind of like in a continuous process? Like, are you able yep. to query that in real time? Can you produce alerts? 
um, are you able to collect the uh, contextual information to allow somebody to triage that that alert? Uh, there's there's a lot that goes into that, um, and it's it's very kind of like what you're saying. It's it would be extremely valuable if uh, most internal red teamers kind of were aware of how that that process works, so that they can help to identify issues uh, within the process of you know where did that go wrong? Because a lot of times we'll see somebody saying, oh, I have a detection for uh, credential dumping, but it didn't work when, but then the red team will come through and say, oh, well, we did the, we did credential dumping in it. You didn't catch us. And it's, it's one thing to identify that there was an issue with the detection or with the ability to detect it. Um, but another thing is where did that detection fail? And I think that's a, an important uh, conversation to have and an important thing to identify as far as like the root cause of the failure. Yeah, you got to go beyond just saying, um, you know, we bypassed some controller. You know, we we um, we did privilege escalation. It's what does that mean? What were the 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 actual steps that were involved? Because just as the red teamers, I'd argue, as part of the defense, the defense is part of the red team side. So it, it's just really one big defending team, and the job of the red teamers is to play that threat. They're supposed to understand threat, threat techniques, how to apply these things. And that's their side of the equation. Um, so that when you say you did some technique, um, those details and those nuances are not always known by defenders. And, and I mean, I've been that person in the past. If you asked me to sit behind any sort of standard blue teaming tools, you know, Splunk or any kind of SIM and start to uh, digest and utilize those tools, I'm going to be really bad at it because I don't understand what's going on and how to utilize those tools. Do I know the techniques and the indicators that my threat tools um, generate? I, yes, I do. But um, sometimes that telemetry, you gotta have a conversation on blue and red to understand those things. And, and I know do you do a lot of work on the uh, decomposing these things so you can actually try to understand some technique. And uh, you know, I'm a big fan of taking a technique and decomposing it into its elements so that you can say, okay, what can we do with this? And uh, that's a side that you've got to have the red and the blue side because you have to have someone understand the threat to to execute those things, execute these attacks of some scenario, and then be able to decompose those for something that blue to, to use. Um, there's something that uh, I don't know where I learned this. Someone said that I, I don't know where I got this, but I know a buddy of mine used to say this back when I was in the uh, I worked on the red team with the DoD. Um, he was a non-technical person, but probably one of the best speakers I ever worked with, and it could explain these concepts and just really bridge that gap. So it was good to watch someone who was non-technical and didn't get clouded by all the technical, but who could uh, explain this. But he would say stuff. He would say this. He'd say, um, "When if you think like you've heard of things like you know you need to think like the enemy or think like the th uh, threat," and we we say that a lot. It's like, "Oh, you need to make sure you can think like this." And what I would argue is if you could say you can think like a threat, that's like saying you can think like a chef and now you have the ability to cook gourmet meals. So you can't think like someone. You've got to be able to act like that threat. So you've got to be able to have that component. And that's where the red teaming comes in to be able to act like that threat so you can actually apply those realistic um, effects and impacts. And uh, that, that's really what we, we, our red teams have to do. Um, and we can, we can go in and, and maybe we'll talk about this later on the whole concept of red teaming and some of the, uh, the misunderstanding of, especially as I see, uh, the same things come up in, uh, new, new people coming into the industry. Um, it's, it's interesting to see their take on, on what this, this is. Yeah. I think, you know, to your point too, when it comes to, um, red teamers explaining what they did during a specific operation to the blue team, oftentimes, like I've heard some people talk about red teaming and just kind of drop tools that they utilize when performing an, a certain execution or a specific action. But the reality is that doesn't really tell us blue teamers exactly what type of technology you leverage to perform that action, right? So say if you use like Mimikatz versus like Powersploit to do DC sync, those could have totally different capabilities as to how the action or behavior was performed. The data might be somewhat similar, but there might be something else that the defender could leverage. But I don't really see that in depth looked into the technology um, very often when red teams are explained or operations are explained in general. It's similar to how like Jared came out with the abstraction for the defender side. I think something as equally um, as important could be applied to the red team side because people toss tools on Twitter all the time and says, this does X in .NET. 
And it's like, okay, cool. But like, can you explain that more in depth? Because that doesn't give me enough context exactly. Because one way could be using a Win32 API. Another way could be using a, um, like an internal function by Microsoft, you know, or using Com. you know, all these different technologies that um, could could be leveraged by defenders, um, but it's just that isn't necessarily explained. And I feel like some of that tradecraft is somewhat hidden from the defenders because they don't want that tradecraft um, seen just because people like see it as secret sauce. But the reality, like that's your job as the red teamer. Your right, your job as a red teamer is to explain that secret sauce to the defender to help the ability of the SOC or to help the defenses yeah. of the security um, industry as a whole. So. One thing I see, and I do still do this now, is um, as you grow as a as a red teamer, sometimes you realize you don't have to go and do the the biggest, latest, and greatest thing. That's not really what your job is. Your job is to stimulate and engage some idea that's going to measure or train your defensive element. That, that's really what you're doing. You're not really looking for findings. You're not doing bug hunting. That's for pen tests and vulnerability assessments. But we're really looking to say, okay. All this time and money has been spent on defenses. Uh, let's make sure we can engage those as a real threat for training and get some real world experience, like going through the entire process. But also we want to improve our defenses. And to your point, Johnny, is you need to understand why you're running this random tool. And what I see is in red team community, and there's nothing wrong with this. We all have skills and we all have limitations and we can't write as individual red teamers due to time or capability, we can't build every single tool and technique that's out there. But what we can do and utilize, and as we grow as a group, as a team, um, through red teaming is you can uh, design a scenario for your engagement. And your job ultimately is controlling indicators. That's what I like to say is your job is to try to to plant indicators or prevent indicators from occurring at different phases and stages of an engagement to look at, um, you know, the response, the detection response capabilities of those things. Sometimes you want to be quiet because you're not trying to measure something. Sometimes you want to get louder and loud and quiet is just relative terms. But what I, whenever I design an engagement, um, I, I always say I take a defensive consideration in mind. So in other words, I am going to run, I'll just keep it simple with like PowerShell. I'm going to, I, I, I know how, I have the tool, there's PowerShell. That's my goal to do some enumeration with PowerShell. Well, I have to, I can't just run that. Sure, it's a capable tool. It has a capability, but I have to say defensive cap uh, considerations to say, do I consider that the indicators that are going to come through this, um, through this tool, are they going to get me caught? Do I want to get caught right now? Um, can I avoid um, detection through modifying or adjusting things? Um, it might sound silly, but, you know, maybe with, you know, with PowerShell, you have a, a consideration that, I will uh, not run, you know, a standard uh, web downloader where I don't use IEX or basic for encoding. So that's my consideration. I say, hey, I think they're going to detect these simple things. And I know I'm keeping this simple, but maybe I just want to change it to actual unencoded uh, PowerShell commands to run. And that's that could be your assumption. And whether I'm right or wrong from a uh, from a uh, threat side, if this is my capability and skill at this time, that's what I can present to the defenders. And that's a good way to start that conversation. So like Johnny, if we were working together, I can say, this was why I did it. Here's what I did. Not saying it was good or bad and quality can come over time, but at least you are being um, active in uh, controlling what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I think if people could talk about why they're doing something, not just I ran, <clears throat> I ran this tool. You know, a lot of you guys, uh, Spectre Ops have a lot of like the ghost pack tool sets. People use those all the time. But then if you start digging into why or how does it work, I don't know if a lot of people would uh, have those answers. Yeah, I think, you know, it's almost like I don't know how true this is um, per se, but it almost as if if a big name red teamer drops a tool, people are more likely to utilize that tool based off of the name versus the technology that might apply to it as it comes to an environment. I don't know how accurate that is from a red team perspective, but it seems that could be be a play somewhere. I mean, so so that gets back to the perception of red teaming. Um, when you start to, if you start to describe a red teaming job versus a defensive job, red teaming always sounds cooler. Um, you know, it, it is the, hey, you just got to go hack stuff. You're going to go break into this thing. You're going to be sneaky. 
Um, or at least maybe it doesn't always sound cooler, but it appeals to a lot of people. And if someone, a smart person writes a tool and then enables a capability that is just a, uh, a, a demonstration to say, oh, I can click this and, and hack all the things. Um, they, that, that individual, especially early in their career, might feel empowered and like, oh, look at this. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a great hacker because I ran this tool. Um, and, and, and that's a, it's not necessarily good for our industry because on the flip side, the defense side, it doesn't really help to, uh, to improve the defenses. Now you have a tool um, that you got to defend against. But on the other side, I challenge defenders to say, okay, there's a lot of this, you know, commodity off the shelf type things. There's not a lot to, uh, you can create a feed of here's common tools. I need to make sure I can defend against these things. And you can start measuring yourself against those. Even if it's non-modified, just like, let me pull these things off the shelf. Um, what capabilities do I have to defend against this commodity style, um, these commodity attacks? Yeah, I think uh, one of the great things about Red Team, and you kind of alluded to it a little earlier, is that the the Red Team is the only adversary that's actually going to sit down with you afterwards and uh, give you feedback, right? And allow you to ask questions and, and provide that. I think back to like when I was in the Air Force, we, we used to do FOD walks, foreign object debris walks on the on the flight line, yeah. right? And so the idea was uh, you would all line up in a line, walk down, walk down the flight line looking for debris that might get sucked up into like a jet engine or something like that. Um, and the question is, how do you know that you've got all the all the debris? Well, sometimes the, the general or whoever the commander was would put down like a, a little like token of a golden BB or like something, something that was very uh, identifiable, right? And and they would wait for the FOD walk to end. And then they would say, okay, did anybody find this item? And if you were the person that found that item, you get like a day off of work. Well, if the, if the commander, if they finished the FOD walk and they didn't find the, like the golden BB or whatever the planted item was, then, then you know that you know, something, something went wrong or they didn't, they didn't do a great job at, uh, at performing the task, right? Um, I think that's a really great thing that we often... I often see with customers that uh, is not leveraged is basically uh, testing testing con- preconceived notions. So like you have you have this idea that you're doing everything right as as a defensive team or that you you've at least solved some discrete problem, right? So again, like the credential dumping example, um, you think that you've solved it, but you're not going to know until somebody goes goes through and does credential dumping in a number of different ways. And then it kind of makes me question uh, like. Uh, how important is it for a red team to be conducted from kind of like beginning to end in one like clear narrative versus uh, kind of maybe focusing on a very discrete topic like credential dumping and then providing numerous different perspectives of how credential dumping can be achieved to like really validate kind of uh, that idea of how it's being solved, right? So one of the questions that we always face is, how do I know that I have a sufficient answer to credential dumping? Uh, from a de- preventative or a detective uh, perspective, and the the answer is is well one I think anyway I'm curious what your opinion is but I think one is did you do the research and this is the the technique decomposition kind of idea with the abstraction did you do the research to understand how that credential dumping actually works and like have you logically answered all the different questions at each layer instead of just addressing it at the most superficial layer and we could talk more deeply about that and then the other the other thing is. Did you bring in a diverse, uh, a diverse skill set like red, a red team, maybe even diverse red team? So maybe you have an internal red team and, a, and an external red team come in and go at that credential dumping technique, and you know come up with different variations of how to uh, how to actually conduct that that attack and validate that you are in fact preventing or detecting it across across the board. So you're bringing up a uh, an interesting point that I've been considering actually the last few years now. Um, Early days of red teaming, you're looking at full engagements to where I, I break red teaming down into three phases, get in, stay in and act, just keep things simple. And so you're looking at initial access, gaining access to your, to something that has a certain level of characteristics. It's often uh, governed by a lot of preventative controls and bypassing of those where you, you've got to gain access through phishing, through some flaw in some website, whatever it is, doesn't really matter. So you can get in. That has its own set of uh, of detections. Then you have stay in, and this is where you where you live on network. You're doing all of your things. You're you're gaining accesses. You're privilege escalating. You're laterally moving. You're you're stealing data. Doing all this. I argue this is um, has the most opportunities for defenders 
to uh, to to catch you. Um, but when you when you boil all these down, um, what you're ultimately trying to do is understand detection and response capability. Um, this is what you have. We can have we can improve uh, preventative controls, and that's great. So I look at like when you're doing these things, you can reduce the attack surface by having better preventative controls. You know, it's where you physically can't do anything. And as you reduce the attack surface, that sh means, in theory, that your defenders have less to worry about and they can focus on the important things. You know, that's a, it's a nice goal. You'll never reduce the attack surface to zero. And um, I don't like to say, you know, a lot of these attacks that come out with, like, with the solar winds attack or so, some something that comes out, it's like, oh, no, now all of a sudden just things happened. I would argue that any organization, that should just be annoying, but they're dealing with it fine. Because you should always assume that something's going to breach in. Because things happen. So your preventive controls will fail you at some point in time. Period. They will. So now you really, really need to care about your detection and response capabilities. And that's not just a technical blurb on a, on a machine. This can be um, the more you can normalize it into an alert to, to, uh, to give it to the masses. That's great. But you're going to have to have people doing this actively. And then... The, red, the full red team engagements can actually measure that entire uh, process at a macro level. But with all that said, I'm, what I really am a fan of is um, taking a small hypothesis, one or two techniques, a small little sliver, and di diving into this. Ignore everything else around you. Forget like how you got in. Don't have those conversations where we gave you those creds, where we put you on this box. No, I'm saying... Figure out what those conditions are to say, I'm sitting on this box. I'm looking at some new, you know, injection, memory injection technique I'm trying to explore. Well, just sit on that box physically and start to run through these to understand that. Uh, because you need to understand it from a technical perspective to know what it looks like. Plus, you need to see what kind of telemetry you have. Sometimes you have the telemetry, sometimes you don't. But um, understanding at that macro level will give you that capability because... You know, I'm also a big fan of uh, having some sort of defensive strategy in place um, to where you're actually defending against some hypothesis or some sort of uh, idea of a threat. So it, when a threat does these things, we should be able to defend against that and have effective detection and alerting capabilities. And I really think red teams should focus on that. I, I'm not, it sounds weird. I'm not a fan of purple teaming. And to, honestly, I'm not even a fan of the word red teaming. Because they are, uh, they're used so strange. So many people say red teaming is an advanced pen test, and I can go off on a whole different topic on on those concepts. So when I'm talking about these, I'm really looking at we're looking at uh, threat operations. We're saying we want to defend against a threat. That's ultimately what we care about. Some threat is doing something. Some person is sitting behind the computer, behind the keyboard, actively trying to do bad things to you with, with these types of tools. That's really what we're trying to defend against. But if you can break those down to granular pieces, now you can give the defense that, hey, if this happens, you have a, have a strong indicator. And you can be ta uh, tactical in that to say, well, a threat's got to go from A to Z. It, eventually, most threats are going to have to filter down and do like, you know, these few steps. Let's focus on those first, because that means at least in this kill chain of, of events, we should be able to see a threat doing something. Um, it's not always that easy, but it's a really, really good approach. But it means defenses have to drive their detection and strategy capabilities. One, they have to have detection and strategy capabilities. They're not just, oh, we outsource this to XYZ SIM, but we actually have strategies in place. And it means we have to understand the threat. We can't just patch everything. Well, I think I think back to my, my Air Force experience and exercises. So we did exercises like... Uh, Terminal Fury, Red Flag, Cyber Flag, all these all these yep. big military exercises. And the red team was, you know, is the NSA red team, the Air Force red team, all kinds of different different red teams. But there was always learning objectives, which was, hey, the blue team, those are the people being exercised. They want to, they have some new capability or they want to, you know, test some part of the process. And, and the responsibility of the red team is to test that part of the process, regardless of what it takes to get there, right? And so if the thing that we're testing is, the ability to detect a specific technique, how they got to the point at which they execute that technique is irrelevant, right? So there's no there's no argument of, oh, well, I would have, you know, I would have stopped you if I, if you would have actually had to gain access the right way. It's like, well, that's not what we're testing. 
what we're testing is your ability to detect, detect this technique and in a yeah. vacuum right so like all things being equal in a vacuum if you can't detect this technique then there's no chance in hell that you're going to detect this technique outside of the context of a very discrete test right because you're then you're dealing with uh you know hundreds or thousands of alerts uh you don't know that there's an attacker coming at you there's all kinds of things going on right and so like let's let's first identify whether or not in a you, test environment where everybody knows what's going on the thing works as we expect it to work and then if that's the case then let's you know maybe we we abstract it a little bit more and go go further out to where you don't like maybe it happens at a time that you don't know when it's going to happen or maybe we uh do things leading up to it but i think i think one of the important concepts is learning objectives and making sure that uh, or training, learning or training objectives, right? Yeah. So what, what do you want? What are you hoping as the uh, target audience of the red team? What are you hoping to test or learn or achieve as a result of the test? Before we move on, I think Johnny might've had something to contribute to that. Yeah, I think, this. you know, to that point, you both kind of touch on this is there's a mindset kind of aspect that comes from a blue team and a red team perspective, right? And I think both of which need to have um, the thought process of how do we capitalize this opportunity as much as possible. And in that sense, what I mean is if I'm a defender and a red team's coming in, that is a learning opportunity for not only me as an individual, but for my organization and environment as a whole. It's because the reality is this, like all we know about attacks and operations come from previous activity, come from things that we, someone already knows because once the day comes that we actually get hit from an, like an actual ATP group, like, or APT group, the reality is they could throw something at us that we've never seen before, right? So we have to, and from a red team perspective, change the mindset of, okay, well, I have to hide these trade secrets and the secret sauce um, because I found this out and I think it's really cool and I want to wait to release a blog about it. Well, if you're on an op or something like that, you want to capitalize that technique to make sure it works in that environment, but you also want to teach that to the blue teamer or the defenders so that they can find a way to defend against in the future. Because odds are, if you found it out, someone else has found it out before too, probably, or at least have seen it before, at oh, least yeah. from a red team perspective. It's just they haven't released it as well. And so it's, it comes through that, in my opinion, in my head, it comes through a life cycle, a defender and re defensive and response life cycle is um, because I've said this day in and day out, there's not just one detection for technique because there's so many abstractions of the technology that can happen. You know, there's so many different avenues and, and a red teamer can go. Right. And so when we start to layer that knowledge, we can apply those to detections and start layering detections and set up alerts that are more robust than being very singular or precise based off one very specific activity or behavior. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, you really have to know, uh, have both sides of that because the the defenders, if they're not given this, this information, um, they're going to have to go learn it somewhere. You know, they have to, or they're just going to take whatever blog posts and their threat intel feeds or anything, and it's always a filtered down view. So a huge benefit red teamers have is to burn their access and burn their knowledge. Um, and a lot of people don't want to give that stuff up because it's secret sauce and they can use it on the next one. And, and I understand that from one side to say, okay, now I can do this. But my question is like, if I've proved it once that, Hey, I have a zero day in this situation. Um, a scenario happened that, and I went through this as an early red teamer was I was proposing an idea to say, Hey, let's assume windows had some new privilege escalation. So this is post MS 08067. Yes, that was still a thing, but we were as a group, everyone's considering it. Let's kind of pretend this is patched and it's not a thing at the time. So it was just a few years after this. Um, maybe maybe four years or so after that. And I was proposing, well, let's just assume something like this happened and no one wanted to buy into that. They didn't want to say, hey, no, you're going to have to prove that you can break into this. There's no privilege escalation. There's no attacks that you can do on Windows. Well, then a few years later, you know, we have uh, NSA uh, leaks and tools that come out and you get like things like Eternal Blue. And I was like, oh, hey, you remember guys when, when I was talking about like, let's do this scenario? Well, yeah, these things exist. It's not about does the tool exist or not, is we need to test these scenarios. And I would say if you're going to start to become a professional red teamer, not just someone who wants to hack things, that's your job is to come up with threat scenarios and exercise that scenario. I don't care what tools you use. I don't care any of that stuff. Your understanding of how technology works and how to implement utilizing the restrictions you have and the limitations, because, I mean, we don't all have zero days. 
And if you do have one, they're ephemeral. So you can't, your business can't be built off like having these magic capabilities. So you're going to have to uh, do some sort of assumed access or like say, hey, we're going to uh, walk the scenario through this because we're, our job is not to say, can we hack these things? It's to stimulate engage, as you were saying, Jared, to help train and measure uh, these defend the defenders. Um, you've got to be able to do that. And, and that's a huge difference between um, what I see as professional red teaming or professional red teaming leaders because uh, there's a lot of people out there. And if you follow Twitter and see this, there's just, you know, everyone gets excited about cool hacking tools. I do too as well, but they don't really have any meaning um, if you can't apply them to make things better. Yeah, I think two things on that. It's interesting because I think if you look at the, um, at like specific type of activities and behaviors through time, it has evolved, right? Like I, for anyone that doesn't know, I'm pretty young, so this is more of a Joe and Jared thing. But way back, way back in the day, PowerShell was very prevalent and being used in ops. Probably that was a very long time ago. It was a very big hit a long time ago. I wasn't around for that, but now is like time has moved on. Win32 APIs have been leveraged more and more, right? RPC has been leveraged more and more, um, and so you know, and I think part of that is a push on the red team to get better and better and better but from a defensive perspective as well. So like one thing that I'm trying to say is from a defender perspective, we're always behind. And what I mean by that, we're either behind from the knowledge by which the technology can be used or we're behind in the skill set that we need to have in order to find and learn that technology. Right. So like someone might not know how to do dynamic or static analysis, how to dig through IDA, et cetera. Right. That's a knowledge base. They have to learn. They're the, they're behind on that because they want to go dive into a technology or someone might have the knowledge in their head from a red team perspective on a specific technology and not release it while I'm behind as a defender because it was never explained to me or I have to read it from a second source or a third party. And so when it comes to that, there might be a fear from a red team perspective where it's like, okay, why well, figure out this cool way to do this technique? Um, I don't necessarily release it because that's my value, right? They might think, okay, this is, this might be where I stop and end as a security professional. Like I've, I've maxed out. Well, the reality is if you share that with the defenders, there might be a cool defensive perspective, which then might give you more insight on a different way you can perform that same activity or behavior that pushes you even further um, for your like intellectual capacity, right? And so pushing people um, to dive deeper and deeper into the technology as time goes on. I mean, we've seen it with history with security, and I think it's only going to become more prevalent. But I think part of the reason why sometimes that tradecraft is hidden is due to that fear of people not wanting to max out yet in their career. Maybe. But of that, what I liked what you said was that uh, you lumped myself and Jared as the as the same ages. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think Joe's like 20 years older than me. Well, the thing is, like, what, what, once you get past a certain age, for me, you know, like, everybody's just at that, at that age gotcha. at that point. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, that's funny. You also mentioned that PowerShell was a long, long time ago. I mean, yes, like it wasn't. Nobody used PowerShell at all when I started, and I, I'm not that old. Hey man, listen, it's <laughs> but do pe people use PowerShell a lot, a lot now? Uh... Yeah, yeah. Maybe, well, maybe that's a that's a good sign for how uh, collaboration between vendors, red teamers, and defenders can actually uh, improve overall security of t different technologies. Was, that's another good point though too it's like we one of the first things i heard whenever i started industry you know i took the specter ops red team course and one of the first things i heard was like well don't leverage powershell use like unmanaged powershell i mean sure in the class it was explained to me eventually but like i think that's told to by a lot of people and like defenders be like oh they shouldn't be using powershell what's well, like why you know i don't know if a lot of people have that context because yeah, they just I been told not to do X and they're like, okay, well, I'm not going to do X then. I think, well, I, th I think one of the main indicator, one of the reasons why people moved away from PowerShell is because, uh, it's susceptible to detection, meaning that there is, uh, accessible telemetry that tells you what's happening, uh, within the PowerShell engine that you can then use to like derive whether or not it's malicious activity. Right. And like, that's, that's a, a testament to like the, the security team at Microsoft that's in, that was in charge of PowerShell, right? They they put in, they made sure, they they understood how attackers were using it. They understood what uh, what insights needed to become available so that, and they understood how uh, defenders are actually leveraging those insights in an enterprise 
detection kind of uh, process, right? And they, they were able to kind of put those three things together and derive a solution, which is, you know, script block logging, for instance, um, is, a good, is a good example of that. But that, that gives you really good insight into what's going on or like AMSI is another, another really good kind of te technological advancement that came out as part of that. And, you know, that's, that's really awesome. And then basically the idea is, is like PowerShell has all this, like it's very illuminated. What, what's happening in PowerShell is very illuminated, right? You could do all this obfuscation and all that kind of stuff. But like at the end of the day, you like somebody can go and see what's happening. Not, not to mention that like if something's obfuscated and you see it, it is like clear indicator that something, something's going on, right? Um, but what, what ended up happening is attackers kind of moved to more, more opaque kind of, uh, sources. So something like C sharp .NET doesn't have the same, you know, illumination or like telemetry, uh, that, that PowerShell does. Right. And so that's kind of like the thing that everybody moved to because C sharp and PowerShell are basically the same thing with slight syntax differences. And the idea was, well, we could very easily port all of our PowerShell code over to C sharp and, uh, kind of do the same thing, but we don't have to, we, we don't have the same like security insight uh, into, into what we're doing with C sharp. And then as, as time goes on, .NET is making progress, you know, towards trying to provide similar illumination. Yeah. And, and you have the similar, um, it gets back to understanding fundamentals. I mean, we can start saying, well, I start writing things in Python or go or rust or, or whatever. So then you, your telemetry is even different. So it comes, what I've seen, um, Growing up, non-security. So when I started doing stuff, it was all just IT. Security was just a job. I didn't even realize at the time that that was a its own career path. So I spent many, many years just doing straight system administration and stuff. And those building blocks it, it is uh, were really crucial to understand how technology worked. Fundamental, you know, networking technologies, things like the HTTP protocol, all of these fundamental components of how things work that that build all the things we use now. I'm not saying it's bad as I see people are coming up now, but people are really, really fast tracked into, Hey, I'm going to go do, you know, this hacker thing and not understanding fundamentally how technology works. I, I still see that very, very common, but I always like to use like the HTTP protocol as an example. Um, if you understand how, what's going on and how this works, then you can, di you know, you can decompose that thing and digest it and understand what it looks like. Maybe what things look good or bad, you know, the uh, the whole there was a time where you know SSL was like oh we got to have SSL because that means security and there was there's a big push to say well let, let's make sure that everything is SSL protected because that means secure you know make sure you kept your lock on the, the site so we have all these like misunderstandings and mis uh, conceptions on what security is and we as an industry did it to ourselves you know like there's a lot of the the security experts who were wrong or, or promoted the wrong things and then you know, the simple things bubble up, but we have to go past that because um, there's only a small community who actually do this threat portion. If you still look at the number of testers and such in the world, you're really focused. There's a lot of focus on vulnerability testing, penetration testing, nothing wrong with that. It's extremely important. It's got its own roles, but they have a totally different goal. And if you only do those, then you're nearly, I would argue you're never dealing with a threat you are just doing attack surface reduction. You know, you do some mitigations, you reduce attack surface. You do mitigations, you do reduce the attack surface. You don't directly address the threat um, and understand or, or, how they actually work. Or exercise the process, right? So like, exercise the process, yeah. yeah. I think uh, one of the things that you kind of implied is, I think I think you were implying this anyway, is I this, did. this idea, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, this idea that like, whether somebody uses PowerShell, C Sharp, Rust, Go, you know, C++, whatever, whatever the language that they write the program in is, that's all superficial, right? And like, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm going to take superficial wins when I can. Like, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to cast aside uh, a detection that finds the hash of the default version of Mimikatz because, you know, it's not comprehensive, right? I'm going to take that win. But like, that, that's, I'm not going to spend much time thinking about that, right? I'm going to put that in and say, okay, well, that doesn't solve the problem. That solves a very, very specific subset of the problem, um, just like the malicious use of PowerShell. Well, like people aren't using PowerShell just for the sake of using PowerShell. They're using PowerShell to accomplish some, some objective, right? And that object, like the way that they accomplish that objective is what we call a technique from like the MITRE parlance or like the tactic technique and procedure parlance. Um, and 
ultimately they could they could you know affect that that technique regardless of the the programming language that they use so they could do it in c sharp they could do it in python they could do it in go they could do it in rust they could do it in whatever um and so like yeah if i know how they do it in powershell and i know that there's some special words in powershell that they use like certain libraries that they're using i i can i can leverage that information but ultimately this is where we get back to that decomposition ideas like that's that's the most superficial layer of the onion and what we need to do is we need to peel back the onion and start looking into the the more inner working layers right and ultimately the idea is is, is there something that regardless of how i implement this thing is going to be consistent across all implementations whether i use c sharp whether i use powershell whether i use c++ it's all going back to one place right and that that's like the ultimate in detection now like the superficial the the interesting kind of like dichotomy i guess is this the more superficial a detection in general the more uh precise the indicator right so uh that that mimi cat's hash for instance that's going to have basically i mean it, conceptually i guess could have a false positive but it's going to have no false positives for you know sake of conversation they, they don't like maybe somebody could create a hash collision with a non mimi cat's binary but like you know who who would, why would you do that i guess um but there's no there's no false positive so like it's like oh cool we're just going to take that and we get we get true positives for everything that hits here but if i want to detect curb roasting based on the thing that is consistent amongst all curb roasting attacks well that's a tgs rec uh request so like a curb roast ticket granny service request well that's used for legitimate requests as well right so there's i mean it's mostly used for legitimate requests and so you're gonna have tons of false positives and so like you got you got to kind of figure out how how to balance that superficial level with the like the more central core components but i i think focusing on the the language that's being used is is very superficial and there's there's uh we should take the wins that we get there um but we should also be focused on how can we identify this attack technique regardless of the language that the attacker is using to yeah. accomplish it and that uh, your your Kerberos example is uh, is one I like to use to show uh, uh, some sort of threat based technique. It's a very technical technique, and let's say you know you've gone through a lot of decomposition and understand it technically. But if you're a defender, maybe you kind of understand it superficially. And let's say the red team has no idea about telemetry. And these are these are fair things to say. Like if I'm the attacker, I really don't know what you guys are going to be able to see. But I, as the attacker, should be able to break down the this thing from a technical perspective of here's what i'm running not just the i ran you know some some uh curb roasting tool you know i ran rubius with the curb roast flag you know no it's like i actually understand what it's doing and you go walk through all those requests and then you can start to say answer questions not even assuming anything and say okay where are detection opportunities and, and that's where you can have the conversation between the offensive side and the defensive side to say, what what's there? What do we have? Do we even have this? Before you even try to build any uh, defenses. But these types of engagements are probably what I, uh, I, I drive a lot of uh, um, organizations to now to work on, is something a little bit more narrowly focused to focus on specific techniques. Um, there, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can follow the news, follow any of the Twitters on on things that are kind of popular right now you could just pluck one of those and say okay we're going to create a scenario out of that and say can we do this how do we repeat this what is our telemetry what's our capability of defending because from a leadership perspective if you're not being asked they're thinking could my organization protect against whatever this thing that came out you know when the solar wind stuff came out it's like oh are we okay a lot of people focused on the wrong things and they focused on do we have solar winds and that was the wrong thing. You're looking at, no, no, no. Like, what happens after the fact? You could easily use this as a, a generic supply chain attack and say, let's just assume these things and start to build out scenarios. And if you chose to go down that path and use that as engagement, it could really, really open your eyes on on your actual security operations as a whole. Like, is it even effective? Yeah. One, one thing that you kind of made me think about just now is uh, our red teamers basically uh teachers right and like my thought process is is um i generally believe that you know not everybody that's in cybersecurity needs to be super technical um 
but somebody on every team needs to be technical, right? Because like, how are you going to write detections, which are inherently a technical thing for an attack? Uh, if you don't understand how that attack works under the hood, right? You're going to end up writing a bunch of superficial detections and you're going to have, uh, you're kind of, kind of going to be like ignorance is bliss mode, right? You're, oh, well, we wrote a detect, like we grabbed a pre-generated rule for, you know, Mimi cats and we're just going to put that in place and we're, we're good to go. Um, but like, I, I kind of feel like, uh, so let me tell a story. So I was talking about cyber flag and red flag. I don't remember which one this happened at, but I, I just remember this was when like, golden tickets were first becoming super popularized. And I, I remember that we were uh, in, in like the sock and somebody came in like the white cell, the guy that was kind of the referee for the, for the exercise came in and said, they got a golden ticket. And we're like, oh shit, man, they got a golden ticket. Everybody like, everybody, they got a golden ticket. And then we kind of like paused and we're like, okay, what's the golden ticket? Right. But then like the, you know, whoever the boss was, was like, we need to go, we need to go detect that golden ticket. And it's like, we don't even know what the hell a golden ticket is. How are we going to detect it? Right. Well, at the, the great thing about those exercises, and this is where like the teacher kind of question kind of comes in as well as the learning objective is the red team at, at the end of every day of the exercise, the red team would sit down with the blue team and you'd have uh, like a hot wash or like after action report. Um, and they would say, okay, this is what we did today. Uh, or like, tell us what you saw. And, oh, we saw this. We saw this. We saw this. Okay. They're like, okay, well, A wasn't us. That's just, you know, some weird stuff happening on the network. B was us. So good job there. And then, uh, you know, you didn't, you didn't detect D, which is the golden ticket. And we're like, okay, well, we didn't detect that because we have no idea what a golden ticket is. The idea, like from my perspective, if you're a red teamer and you used a golden ticket attack, you better damn well be able to explain to me what a golden ticket attack is. Oh, um, yeah. Which Agreed. then kind of makes you into an instructor or like a teacher of, uh, in some sense, right? Well, so again, I, 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 like, I don't know where I'm going with that, but like, I, there's kind of like two questions is like, what, how important is it for a red teamer to kind of function as a teacher? And then the other question is, is, is it, is, and this is more of a rhetorical question probably, but is it more important for red teamers to be, you know, technically, knowledgeable than it is for like blue, our blue teamers more like we're working with tools and we just need to be able to operate the tools or how like how important is it relative for a defender and i think the answer for me personally i think the answer is is you should be as technical as possible um or somebody should be t as technical as possible yeah. on the blue team um but like how important is it relative for blue teamers to be as technical as red teamers so i think i think you already know the answer and it's a uh... You've got to have people with those skills. Um, if you go back to red teaming, third emulation side, it's not a single person sport. Um, so it it should be a multi you know multiplayer game that things are going on. So you should have multiple people playing offense, multiple. There's always multiple people playing defense. You know the the, the numbers of defenders um, always outweighs the offensive side. But what you have to have is a good combination is you know, a few red teamers, a highly technical red teamer who understands this and can go and like you mentioned, like um, golden tickets, like they can go and explain all this, how it moves through, how the requests are done. They can explain this. They may be able to explain it to only to another technical person, but whether you like it or not, you've got to have someone to be able to translate this over to the defensive side. And they have to be able to speak both sides. They are going to have to speak up through like a leadership chain and understand business impacts, why this is important, how this is going to impact your security operations as a whole. You know, <clears throat> whether you have to create a whole new detection strategy, create a new, you know, go collect new telemetry, whatever it is. But you also have to break that down into a technical component. So oftentimes, like I actually use this as a formalized process at the end of any engagement where I have a leadership briefing and I have a tech on tech. So the skills that it takes to do that especially the leadership side, actually both sides are very much, you've got to be able to teach. You've got to be able to present and, and walk through what's going on. Um, I, I have, and I've worked with lots of people who are really, really technical, who just explain technical things. And you're like, I'm not exactly sure where this is going. This is, this is just like, you, you have a lot of words here. They're not meaning anything because you've got to be able to meet your audience. And, and you know, if you mention your side on that golden ticket, not saying you aren't capable, but you've got to find out where that knowledge is. Like if you didn't even have a base understanding of like Kerberos, well, it's like, okay, now I've got to like, 
you got to figure out where that's at. So I can't just, you know, start spitting out uh, technology without having at that base understanding. And that also leads, and this is strange for like, if you're looking at internal team, red teaming, offensive security, red teams versus external internal teams have the opportunity to be those, those like trusted insiders and have that information because they can actually go and measure that. It is more difficult for external teams. So when you hire an external team, you better have someone on your blue team who can uh, translate whatever mess you got from that red team. <laughs> Liaison basically. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to be able to have someone who can pull that in. So you've got to have that, that defender. I mean that, that, that smart person or smart people on your team who can decompose that because when you're looking at this, we don't have enough resources to do all this. We all have too much work. We have too many things to do. Um, but if you can build in efficiencies of taking the smarter, more experienced people on your team who can build these things out into some sort of process into sort of alerts, detection, something that's useful by the others, then maybe not everyone understands all the details, but they can say, hey, if this thing fires that shows this, you know, this attack, then that's important because it's already been done. And now you can normalize that uh, for, for use across the board. Same thing on the offensive security red teaming side. You can have people um, build out tools, processes, automation um, to help gain efficiencies so that you can take a lot of those complex things and share them among all the teams. Um, that's, that, that's, it gets into like efficiencies and, and how to utilize uh, the limited resources. Yeah. I think one of the benefits of having super intelligent people on both ends is the reality within security is if I'm on the defensive side, I'm not going to know everything red team based and vice versa, right? They're not going to know everything defensive based. And what I mean by that is they might perform a specific action that might like, let's just use this as an example. Like it might call the, create process win 32 API. Right. And then whenever they're doing the debrief, they talk about how they created processes with utilizing that win 32 API. If you have someone equally as intelligent on the defensive side, they should hopefully be able to relate that activity with a telemetry sensor or source in some way, shape or form or capacity. So knowing that the create process API could be hooked with inside of Sysmon uh, Microsoft, the 4688, and relate that to the actual telemetry that could then get passed into an actual detection and push through the detection response phase. Um, so that activity, and that, that's what I was going back to in the sense of capitalizing on that knowledge, capitalizing on that actual operation that was performed, because if you don't have that knowledge base, and really the red team could really explain and teach you all these technologies and everything like that, but if you can't actually correlate that to something in your environment that is that you can leverage then I would argue the red team was probably not a really good spend of money at that point. Yeah, I try yeah. to I try to use yeah. like uh, technical instead of intelligent because you know just because you're not technical doesn't mean that you're not intelligent. But I think Joe, what you're what you were going for was like this idea that you need to have technical people, but you also need to have people that understand the business or whatever the like high level strategic objectives are because. You, you do have a danger of if you become too technically focused, you lose sight of like, what are we trying to achieve with this? And it becomes a, how can I break down this problem? Well, maybe breaking that, down that problem isn't, doesn't have the ROI that is worth, you know, it's not going to return the investment that you're putting into it um, oh, yeah. to justify it, right? And so you need somebody that, that maybe, you know, the person that can do both of these things is kind of the unicorn, I guess. But um you know, you need somebody that's able to pr add that perspective while also having somebody that can provide the uh, the technical perspective as well. Yeah, and and yeah, using technical versus intelligent is a good way to put it because um, I I spend a lot of time um, I guess mentoring, teaching, advising, and such. Um, a lot of upcoming red teamers. You know, um, a few years ago I wrote that that course with Sands, and that's what I did for two years was teaching this, and it opened my eyes to see students. Who would come and and have an idea of red teaming and the threat emulation side and say, well, how do I do this? How do I start this? And so you're talking about someone who is charged and tasked with going and doing all these things we we're talking about. Um, it's unrealistic to say they're going to go from zero to 100 immediately. So you could even say maybe some of these engagements that these organizations are using to to improve their defenses are going to be low uh, in uh, technical you know uh, quality, but just because it's simple doesn't mean it's bad because if you can build those fundamentals and start to start off with like um, some level of technical understanding and knowing that that's important, 
you start there and then you, that skill can grow or maybe you acquire people and have more people on the team who have those skills but um effective red teaming and, and offensive security require it does it ultimately does require someone with some technical skill because you need it i don't know it's not exactly true but you you need to have someone who can challenge the defenders that's probably the best way to put it is if you know if jared you know you're crazy like uh smart on like powershell and all these other things like that in the windows subsystems if i came to you and was like hey i was trying to test this stuff um, I would hit walls and challenges, you know, going into some of those details with you. So me, if I was the, if I represented the team, may not be effective. So you do just need to make sure your offensive security team has the ability to uh, uh, to challenge the def- the defenders. Yeah, actually, so this it's kind of interesting what you're what you're talking about. Uh, Luke and I were looking into this this week for we're revamping the detection class that you're familiar, you're okay. all too all too familiar with. Um, yep. And one of the topics that I don't really know how to work it into the class curriculum per se, but it's something that comes up frequently, just like it just did. Um, but it really is this this thing that I learned in like ROTC training for the Air Force, right? But uh, there's this idea called the five, like the five bases of power. Um, this these two people, French and Raven, came up with these these five bases of power, and there's basically five different types of power, right? So there's legitimate power, which is I'm your boss and like I legitimately have authority over you from like a work context. Uh, there's reward reward power, which is like if you do the thing that I want you to do, then I will give you some sort of reward for it. There's expert power, which is you kind of just trust me because I've established myself as the expert in on the topic. And so everybody just knows that like I probably this is the Lee Christensen power, right? It's like every time uh, I think that Lee is wrong about something, I'll kind of challenge him and then he'll prove me wrong. And then it's like, okay, <laughs> yeah, I'll just take his word for it from here on out. Um, referent power, which is basically like uh, everybody likes you. And so they just kind of like defer to you for decision making or they kind of like, you know, want to do things that make you happy. And then coercive power, which is I, I have the ability to punish you. Right. So like if you don't do this, I'm going to you, you got to you're going to be grounded or whatever. Um, those are the five different types of power. And what we're talking about, I think, is like as a red teamer, I think as a consultant, even having that expert power is really powerful. Right. Um, you know, not to. Oh, yeah. It's a tautology to some degree, but having power is powerful. But um, being able to go in there and uh, like kind of prove yourself. One of the things that always used to make me so frustrated in the, in the military or in the government in general is. Uh, and I think this is true everywhere, but this this was particularly common in the government was I've been doing this for 20 years. So like, I know what I'm talking about. And it's like, well, like you just because you're filling a job for 20 years doesn't mean that you actually know what you're talking about. Right. Uh, it's, yes. And like, if my, my perspective is if the only thing that you can point to for why I should listen to you is how long you've been alive, basically, then that's not, that's not a really great w- reason for me to believe you. Right. It's like, Yo, the reason why I know how this works is because like I'm going to literally pull up a console and we're going to type out the command and run the run the code uh, and it's going to prove that what I'm saying is correct. Like I'm much more likely to believe that person than somebody oh, yeah. who's like, oh, I've been doing this for 20 years. So like you should just believe what I say. Um, and I think that's like red teaming, even if it's an internal team, is you're kind of a consultant to some degree, um, you know, kind of like in a consulting type fashion. But uh but it's really important to have kind of that that expert power or be able to draw upon that to some degree. Yep, a hundred percent on that. Um, there's no doubt that you've got to be able to do that because you're representing some sort of expertise that is going to, you know, if you do if you're doing it right, ultimately impact how security operations is working. You know, whether you're just doing some simple alert, adding new telemetry, which t- new telemetry means could be a purchase. You know, you might have to buy some new hardware, new tools, new things. And that's not small to say, oh, yeah, you need to collect. If I just say go collect these logs and it's like, well, why? What's the value and all that? You've got to be able to uh, explain that and understand that. Or, you know, at least on the opposite side, have someone on the defensive side be able to interpret that. And it's better to interpret from someone who uh, who has that, that detailed knowledge and understanding. But, you know, again, when I see these things, this, the red teaming threat community um, it's still a very much a uh, there's a shortage in in uh, people filling the slots out there. There's a lot of jobs open out there, but um, I don't see a lot of 
uh, people qualified to be able to do these things. And, uh, and it, a lot of it comes down to experience, not just technical. There are some good technical experience, but translating that technical experience into something that defense cares about. And, and I always say something that it's always see is, you know, a lot of red teamers get, they want to go hack and break and do all these things. Well, you're never playing on your playground. You're always in someone else's playground. So you can get uninvited and they can take their ball and go home and not invite you back to the playground at all. And if you, especially if you don't have any value or if you're like, have no reason to be there, it's like, well, we're not going to invite you back to come play with us. Um, and, and that's important to be able to, to be that person that they want you to be there, that you're a trusted advisor, you bring real value, um, you know, solve real problems. There, okay. So this is a weird, uh, weird segue, but like the playground, take your ball to go home kind of reminded me of it. There's this like psychological study that was done on rats. Um, I think in the sixties and the idea was, uh, if you pair two, like rats will wrestle with each other, like adolescent rats will wrestle with each other, um, like kind of as uh, to play. And, uh, if, if one rat had a, what they found was that if one rat had a 10% body size, uh, advantage over the other rat, they would always pin the, uh, they would always pin the smaller rat. Um, and so there was like a, you know, might, uh, might makes right kind of like conclusion, which is if you're bigger, you get to set the rules kind of thing. Um, and what they, what they found is, uh, in future interactions between these rats, the smaller rat would have to initiate the interaction, like have to invite the bigger rat to wrestle. Um, and over the course of numerous kind of interactions, what they found is that the, if the bigger rat didn't allow the smaller rat to win 30% of the time, then they wouldn't wrestle at all. Like they would, they would just cease to wrestle. And it's like, it reminds me in college, like my roommate was really good at chess. Um, and was just destroying me. And so I bought a bunch of chess books, read, read up about chess and then like actually learned how to play it for a little while and beat him like 10 times in a row. And then he, we never played chess ever again. And now I don't know anything about how to play chess anymore. Cause I've just <laughs> atrophied. That- but, uh, but like, I think, I think the interesting thing is, uh, and this is an interesting, I never really have thought about this for red teaming, but I think it's, it's an interesting perspective of, uh, you don't always want to be the winner you want like there is some value in you know exercising and making people like kind of get that confidence um and like making oh, it yeah. a learning opportunity right to where like the the objective in life is not to win the game the objective in life is to make yourself uh somebody that people want to play numerous games with consistently yes. and like the objective in business is like you want to be the red, you don't want to be the red team that wins at all costs and like makes people hate you you want to be the red team that people bring back to work with them uh, you know, numerous times over, over a long period of time, because that's how, you know, business functions, right? You want to be somebody that people want to work with. And I think that's like a big takeaway is, um, how, like, it's not necessarily about winning and getting in. It's about providing an opportunity for that organization, you know, whether that's an internal team or whether it's a customer to improve their capability over time and to like, you know, continue those interactions instead of just constantly like, one of the things that we always talk about is like, hey, we run into a customer where they have a red team and the red team just always gets in. They can do whatever they want in the environment. And it's like, okay, well, what's the point of doing that? Right. What's the, like, exactly. what, what, okay. what are we, what are we doing here? And if you're, if you're just constantly owning everybody, then like, you know, it kind of diminishes your value to some degree. Yeah. That, that reminds me of uh, early days of uh, when I was working in the, in the DOT and red team Inc. It was uh, that, it was really starting to get pushed forward and and get aggressive and doing a lot of tests and a lot of really fun technical things were going on. A lot of stuff was happening, but it was very one-sided I would argue. And um, basically the, the, the time it was, I call it the golden age of, of some of the red team, at least in that environment where there was a lot of good learning opportunity for the offensive security teams, not so much for the defensive teams because lots of things get in and they're using really good techniques uh, pressure to perform and attack and gain access and do all these things and then come back and say, how we slapped you around. And, uh, I remember doing that with an organization and it was fun from a technical side. If you just want to get on the keyboard and do some fun hacking and cracking, it was a lot of fun, but you take a step back and I saw this group two years later on a whole unrelated thing. And they were talking to road teaming and they said, yeah, 
Red teaming is kind of bad. Like we, we had this team come in two years ago and they did all these things. And I was thinking, oh, I was the guy who did all that. <laughs> and I, I and, and they were completely right at, at, at what came out of it. And this is where I go back to it's a team effort. So my role was the actual technical person on keyboard doing things. And as this information got translated over, you know, it kind of like the password game, it got away from me. And whatever story eventually got pushed over there, it wasn't the right story that was told. And uh, that's why we talk about teams and individuals, but it's really how are you as a whole group bringing that over? Because uh, um, how many times have you heard that people don't like red teamers? Um, like the defenders, they, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to know what they're finding. I don't want to see this again all the time because uh, it's rare to see red teams viewed as a, like a trusted advisor or as a trusted peer. Um, I've had to, anytime I go to an, to a company or work, you know, especially I was in the consulting, that's what I felt like I had to do every single time. I had to tear those barriers down to say, yes, I understand that the last red team that came and did X, Y, and Z, you know, that's not being a professional team. Here's how it's different. And you have to try to build those relationships up again. And, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not good to, to have that, to be the, the team that no one wants you to, to be there because all you do is come in and slap you slot people around and and then drop a bunch of work because it's like you know it's like hey you drop all these findings on here now i got more work to do it's really not helping my job why don't you come help me and not just give me more findings yeah to that point too it's i think part of it comes to the fact like when being slapped around you feel defenders tend to feel less of like either they're not doing their job well or less as a security individual as a whole in general and i mean like when you're i mean the reality is this there's a there's a fine line between motivating someone and putting someone down and i think part of the issue whenever you just drop knowledge bombs nonstop without the actual teaching aspect you start to go into that putting that individual down or whether it's from a job perspective or a personal technical um, understanding perspective whatever it may be um, so coming at it from a different teaching perspective might be valuable you know, while talking about this, we I think a lot of this has correlated to how the red team can actually benefit the defenders and detection engineering as a whole. But I think there's actually a point to be made, too, of how red teaming can actually help um, the response team as well. So during a red team, um, maybe it could be valuable to um, purposely trigger something or be loud in a certain aspect to see how the response team reacts. Because if they just sit on alerts that aren't going off. They can't really fine tune that process by no means. Um, and they become rusty. So whenever something big like that happens, like we had a client that um, a while back we were talking to a specific alert went off and they had to pull in, what what was it, Jerry? Like 10 people from different teams left and right just to figure out what, like if X happened. Well, that comes from two things. One, not having a very fine tuned process. And then also not being used to utilizing that process and methodology um, very well. Oh so, yeah. And I think, I think That's that, I, yeah. So it's like red teaming doesn't only benefit the detection engineering process, but also the response process as well. Cause it can help fine tune that. Yeah. I usually say, I usually words, uh, detection and response. And maybe I just use those, um, too closely tied, but yeah, the response side is, is really important. Um, I look at, if you're looking at a red team life cycle, I like to say, let's go through, a series of techniques uh, at a granular level to understand a baseline of, of your detection capability, your preventative and detective controls. Let's kind of get a baseline of understanding on that. So what kind of things do you have? What do you not have? And then we can say, we can take that knowing that there might be 10 other things that you can do that'll be totally blind, but you're not, you're, then you can set up an engagement where you're not really triggering what you know is a deficiency. Maybe you're working that separate, but we're saying, okay, if a campaign follows these things, we're supposed to have all the guardrails in place, detections and everything. We want to run through this and let's see what response happens. Because response is a whole different game. Um, we can pretend that we're okay by, by looking at our detections and say, hey, did you fire it? I fired it. I saw it. Yep, we're good to go. Well, just because it popped up doesn't mean it's going to do anything. One of my favorite bypasses uh, from a threat side is to trick a a detection or a response engineer into saying something's okay. And, and there's a handful of ways of doing that. But if you can get the person who's looking at that alert to say, ah, oh, this is fine 
to market as noise, to blend in, to, to market as safe. Now you just have a blanket um, a card to do whatever you want in that network because you've kind of been granted access. Um, so you've got to test those those pieces. Um, there was an engagement I did once to where if you walk through this organization and and talk to them and said, okay, can you do this? You can go through the check boxes, look at their policies. Everything was written really, really well. They had good detection response capabilities and poss- um, um, policies. Um, everything looked actually looked really, really well. So when I look at that, as I said, ah, this is a perfect opportunity for a test. So in this case, uh, this group um, we start doing some engagements on them, uh, going walking through all this and doing attacks. Nothing is triggering. Uh, maintaining, you know, so we're really early on seeing that their detection capability is not what it should be. So it's okay. Let's maintain access, do some things. Actually, once you get in and you you get access and there's nothing triggering, I'd argue, what's the point right now? You know, like what what are you trying to do? Are you trying to find more flaws? Sure, you can go do that, but eventually there's a time where you need to consider a response and saying let's let's, let's see what happens. So. This this organization trying to elevate some responses from simple things such as dropping uh, files that would trigger through AV. So just seeing is that enough to get things going, you know, um, causing some outages on some systems. In other words, slowly elevating to see where are their threshold. Eventually, in this this organization, all their stuff on paper wasn't working, and um, so whether this is good or bad, um, I use a term called Hollywood hacking because. What I take is what are people's perceptions, and this is this might be a wrong thing to say, but again, what are the de- defensive assumptions? Is I assume that the defenders are learning how defenses work from movies, <laughs> and that sounds terrible and it sounds kind of demeaning, but but a lot of times you see this is this is the perception that we get, especially when you go from a leadership side. This is how hackers work. So in this case, to trigger something. Uh, it was emulating, you can argue it was like, it was pre-ransomware kind of days, but it kind of followed the same. Pop up a message, play some audio in the background to 2,000 plus machines that more or less say, hey, we have your systems. We're under, you're under control. And it caused an immediate response because you were saying, hey, we're here. Um, in this case, what happened was that the, the organization literally ripped cables out of the wall and um, they. Uh, they freaked out, told everyone to under attack, you know, unplug everything, and and they just took out their foot gun and shot themselves. And so, you know, just like saying, "Ha, we're here," they freaked out, and it was bad from a response side. And not only that, it took them eight hours to come back up because when you start to disconnect everything, if you don't follow your restart procedures properly. So just standard IT, forget anything. This is like standard DR type stuff if they weren't able to bring this up. So from a technical side, high stress, the defenders, all the staff, really, really tough on them. So you got to be limit that. From a leadership side, they learned that their, they had no, their capabilities were not what, uh, what their team said. And uh, so their response capabilities were poor to, to not a, non-existent. And that was not expected in the beginning to be that bad. But sometimes you got to measure that. Sometimes you actually got to go and do that test. I think those are rare that you do those. And as a, as an organization matures, and once they do that once, you can take those lessons and um, either do some tabletop type style exercises to try to improve those or spend more time on those uh, detection capabilities, especially in, at least in this case, their detection capabilities were not working as, as advertised. I think uh, one of the points you made is you got to be able to follow all the way through. So you're familiar with this, Joe, but for, for the listeners, uh, we have like the, the funnel fidelity is kind of the model that we use to, to talk about detection and response, right? And there's kind of five phases to the funnel. Collection, which is how do you gather information about what's happening in the environment? Detection, how do you identify events that might be of interest? Triage, how do you differentiate between like obviously benign uh, events of interest versus potentially malicious? Investigation, how do you understand, you know, what all is happening with a specific event to determine whether or not it is something bigger? And then remediation, how do you clean up an incident? Um, and the the point of the funnel is you can have the best collection and detection capability in the world, but if you can't triage, investigate, and remediate, then it doesn't matter, right? Like if you yeah. suck at triage and like you just have 
you know, some tier one analysts that all they do is mark things as false positives because they don't feel like going through the, the process and having some rigor, then that's a problem. Similarly, you could have a really good incident response process, but if you can't detect anything because you, you don't have a good detection process, you're going to fail, right? So like it's cool, you invested and you have this really robust incident response process, but you're not detecting anything to respond to. And so you, like that's a failure. Um, and that's why it's, it's important to test across all those things. And that's why the learning objectives are so important is how do we yeah. make sure that we're actually testing the things that we think that we have uh, a good solution for. A, kind of a, a funny story going, I, I don't know if this is the same event, but uh, last week I talked, or last podcast, last episode, I was talking about how I learned PowerShell at a Air Force exercise that was Terminal Fury in, I think, 2012. And, uh, and at that same exercise, it was a 24 uh, seven exercise on site in like a, in a SOC. And they are in an AOC, an Air and Space Operations Center, um, which is like, you know, people running an air war and all kinds of stuff. And we're yep. the, the cyber dudes that nobody cares about. Um, and the, the red team uh, basically ran Thunderstruck at like 3 a.m um like on every single computer in the entire in, entire AOC uh turned it up extremely loud and then it like that's when everybody realized that we were a thing and came into our room and yeah. was like you guys need to fix this and then it was like actually interfering with their ability to like do other learning objectives and they're like hey red team can you guys stop this and they're like what has been started cannot be stopped because they had like done a bunch of like scheduled task type crap, and it was like, oh, yeah, this one, uh, kinda, this kind, this one kind of grew ahead of its own, and is like so, it's gonna just go for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't that one, but it was a uh, um, similar time frame, you know, similar kind of kind of groups, I guess you could yeah. say. Uh, not an exercise. Uh, so oh, fun, fun times. <laughs> Yeah, so shenanigans. So that's one of the, some of those things as you learn as red teaming. You know, the shenanigans part um, and being able to control those are important because you might do that, and then okay, hey, you're doing an exercise, so it's a testing and training range, so it's not so bad. But there's a, a lot of fear of red teamers getting on a target and not doing things, and um, that some of the fear is justified in the sense that there's bad experience from people doing things who don't control their actions or don't, um, you know, they leave things behind. They, they start up stuff and then they just leave stuff behind and don't clean out, clean up after themselves. I have had to deal with that a lot and actually show how we're going to, I'm going to do due diligence to not, to not be the same as before. It's like, Hey, I appreciate what you saw before, but this team is not doing that. And this, here's how we operate professionally. And I think, and whether it sounds cheesy or silly or whatever, that's what we're doing. We're in a profession. So I would argue that you should treat yourself as a professional. Maybe not an expert in all the things, but you should still be professional. And how do you professionally provide offensive security services? And that it, it helps change the thoughts and mindsets. So if you have some, especially if you have people on the team who can help, you know, mentor that. It really, really helps uh, drive people in the right direction. You know, you still need all those technical things, but you've got to have uh, you got to have those soft skills. Um, they're, they're they're very important. You know, I joked about like nobody cared about us until that happened, but that that's actually probably a, a good learning lesson. Is um, maybe the security team isn't the only trading audience for a red team. They're not the only like you know customer of the red team. And in this in this case in this exercise. They were trying to demonstrate how you know cyber effects could could affect like a kinetic war, right? Um, and like you know, if if somebody takes over your computer to where they can play Thunderstruck over it, they can stop you from doing all the other stuff that you're trying to do with your computer, right? Um, yeah. Similarly, like at uh, at Red Flag, it's popular to like change the background on every single computer, yeah. right? Um, and like one of the things that we run into with a customer, one customer in particular of ours is works for a hedge fund. And he's like, one of the hard things is like the people making all the decisions, they're looking at it like from a financial perspective of like, how do I, you know, make more money or, you know, avoid losing, losing money. And sometimes uh, it's hard to get them to see the value of like cybersecurity because it's kind of one of those things that when things are going like you, it appears that everything's going well, but you don't actually know um, unless it becomes like a really big thing, like ransomware or something along those lines. Yep. Um, and so how do I, how do I show them that although it may seem like nothing's, nothing's happening, that there is a huge amount of risk and sometimes like the, and I don't know that anybody in, in commercial, commercial industry would actually allow this to happen, but like sometimes having that, like, 
wide scale effect that goes outside of just affecting the security team might actually be a good way to uh, yeah. get that point across. I think Johnny had a story. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead real quick. No, no, I was just say, so yeah, I, I, earlier I mentioned I used the three phases, get in, stay in and act. Mm-hmm. Act is that like, what are you doing? What, why are you here? And that operational impact is definitely needed. I am, I used to be a huge fan of this to show this every time to say, let's do some sort of demonstration of impact. But as I work with more mature organizations and as I've been able to translate that vocally, I've been able to not have to go there. But there are a a lot of people who still need to get punched to know that it hurts. And it sounds bad to say, but there's a lot of people who do not believe things. And that's fine. And, you know, as a red teamer, sometimes you have to say, well, that's their prerogative. That's their, their choice to go. Um, decide, you know, choose to do that. Again, it's not your playground, but um, I would argue that you might want to consider ha- some sort of impact in your planning, whether you exercise it or not is different. But what well, you got, Johnny? Yeah, so kind of go back about 15 minutes ago to when you guys were going back and forth telling stories from back in your guys' day. Um, you mentioned something that was uh, really cool that I really liked was... Um, in a red team operation, if an alert fires, the defender often goes, oh, an alert fired. It's like, cool, what'd you do with it? Right, there's a handoff process that happens with each alert, and there's an escalation process as well when it comes from passing from one one tier of the SOC to the next to the, resp- to the responsive process um, to the remediation process, right? And so if those things are not actually um, flushed out correctly, um, it's almost like you can identify your you know, you and I both have Jeeps, Joe, so I'll use this as an example. Jeeps are notorious for something going wrong, some way, shape, or form. It's like, well, a ball joint goes out, you've identified that, but if you don't fix it, well, what's the, I mean, great, you identified it, but what are you going to do with that? Um, and then a story back to what you said about the Hollywood version of Red Team. It's kind of funny, when I was in college back in my day, um, <laughs> uh we there was we had the cyber defense club or whatever and i remember i don't remember what the exact talk was that week but i remember at the end of the class we had someone raise their hand and they or the end of the club and they raised their hand and they go when are we going to start doing more irobot shit in here and it's like well what is what it, what, it, what what does that even mean man you know what i mean so it's i think that's yeah. pretty pretty accurate when people think of security as a whole they're like oh shoot there's a green terminal at least i think it's green terminal and people are typing things and hitting enter and going from yeah. there. Those moments happen. And, and what I tell anybody, especially if they're like coming to work with me, I said, you're going to have those moments. You're going to do something cool. And you are either going to high five yourself or maybe, you know, when we could all work together, uh, the person next to you. And after that, no one else is going to care. No one is going to care that yeah. you did some really cool little hackery thing. That is your own personal win and gain. And, and those of us who do this, have that ability to enjoy those little small gains and and not really care if we share them or have a small community to share with, but no one else cares after that. So well, it's like it's like on Twitter all the time, right? It's like you see people are like, "Why don't defenders just do X?" It's like, well, why didn't you try to provide some type of information that gave defenders that insight? Oh, Re- no reverse kidding. reverse Uno card. You know what I mean? So it's just yeah, it's one of those things. You know? Yeah, so. I remember early on hearing someone said. Oh man, I'm gonna hack. I'm gonna take Cali and hack this the, the and you know fire Cali at it or something like that. I was like, what the heck does that even mean? What what do you mean fire Cali at that? <laughs> um, and, and it sounds bad, but at that point in time, um, I uh started to I don't want to say dislike Cali, but I was like, I'm not gonna use Cali anymore because it just seems like it's per, you know perceived as this magical box to do all the things. Nothing against it. It's a great it's a great platform, but I was like, well. Why can't I just do my own? Why can't I go and learn how to to you know figure out what tools I actually do need and can start controlling those, and not just have a random pile of stuff that I am trusting someone else to do? So you mentioned that, and and that that reminded me of that was a time in my life where I said, well, I'm just going to do it myself, and I'm going to start rolling all my own components so that I I make sure I understand how these things actually work, and uh, that made a huge difference for me. Uh, because if I didn't have it, I had to go figure out how to make it or, you know, get tools to, to actually work with that, with that setup. And I actually still do that today and, and just still build my own and roll my own, uh, environments for that. Cool. 
Awesome, Joe. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to close it up and I'm going to pass it over to, to Luke. Sure thing. Thanks again, Joe. We appreciate your time, man. It's always uh, good to talk to you, man. Oh, yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, if you guys want any more uh, detail or want to follow along with us uh, with further episodes, uh, the the most often updates are posted the most often to uh, Twitter uh, over anything else, which is at DCP the podcast. Uh, and then all the episodes and links to all the platforms we're available on are at dcppodcast.com. Uh, thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Awesome. Thanks, Joe, man. Appreciate you coming. Thanks. Spending time thanks, with Joe. Us. Yeah, thanks, guys. Good luck on you growing the podcast. Uh, great stuff so far. Thanks, buddy.